Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we studied the Sabbath school lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this has proved to be an incredible series on the book of Galatians. We're now ready for lesson number 13 in that series with some more very challenging questions. Uh, this is the lesson for September 23 of 2017. We hope you've enjoyed this series as much as we have. We'd like to ask you to bow your heads with us now as we begin lesson number 13. Our kind and wonderful Father, we know that there are many, many things about the story of Paul that we don't know, or about the Galatians that we don't know. We wish we knew more and w would help us to understand more clearly why Paul said what he did to them. But knowing what we do know from his letter, uh, it raises a lot of questions for us to think about to ponder, to discuss, and may that be our experience today as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the Gospels of, I mean, the, the, the stories of Galatians and Romans, although they're written to different churches at, at about the same time, the two letters went sort of in an off, opposite directions, they talk about the plan of salvation. And one of the issues in the plan of salvation is how does God deal with sinners? Now that's not the part we like to talk about most of all, but it's a part of the issue. It's part of what happens. Ultimately, God has to deal with sinners. So now let me ask you a question out there. Is your church, the one you go to every Sabbath, is it more like a hospital for sinners or is it more like a club for saints? Have you helped another Christian to bear his or her burdens recently? And how should the church respond to sinners either outside or inside its ranks? Shouldn't the church welcome sinners? I mean, how many of us are sinners? I think I don't need to even answer that question. As you look around in your church, do church members frequently put others before themselves? Are we practicing the golden rule? I know we probably have enough questions already for the whole evening or the whole day, huh? Matthew 7, 12, you know, these are tough questions. Jesus was not talking about Wall Street's golden rule. You know about the Wall Street golden rule? He who has the gold makes the rules. They were other, there were other law codes before the days of Moses. They included rules like, if you don't want someone to do something to you, don't do it to him. Now I think every mother said that to her, just said that, has said that to her children one time or another. Um, how was Jesus' instruction different? It's positive. Okay, and how, how, how does that mean, how does that affect the, the message? Let's, let's just read that. Do for others what you want them to do for you. This is the meaning of the law of Moses and of the teachings of the prophets. And while we're thinking about that, let me just show in one that's called sometimes the platinum rule do unto others what they would like to have done to them. Platinum. Huh? Yes. Mm. Well, the, <laughs> the other one, you know, is the absence, and, and I think righteousness is not so much the absence of evil yeah. as the presence and the power to do good. So uh -huh. Jesus is, is uh, directing us to the light, not just away from the darkness. Yeah. So to speak. Well, like other human beings, Christians make mistakes. How should we deal with church members who make mistakes? How, does, how do our churches relate to sinners who are outside its membership but who might be considering joining? Do they feel very welcome? I have a personal friend that comes to some of my classes and says he doesn't like being in Loma Linda because you can walk into our giant churches and no one even knows that you're there. So true. Well, it's possible, but uh, it's also possible to be greeted if you, depending on where you come in and how, yeah. how you conduct yourself. But, um, and he could come in and start greeting himself. Yeah, why not? Like, who are you? I, I yeah, come I, from I, such and such, you know? I read about, uh, heard about, or no, I think I heard about it. It was somebody who was had, it, they lived in a in another uh, college town, and they complained that they nobody had ever invited them home 
for lunch, you know, and uh, asked how long you'd been there. Well, I think it was five years, and the answer was that uh, half the people uh, had changed in that period of time. You know, in, in that period of time, half, uh, le more than half the church has has gone. turned over. So mm -hmm. this person really is part of the majority. And the question then follows: Is have you invited somebody mm -hmm. home? Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> well, here's the here's the beginning. The first verse in our discussion for today, my brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in any kind of wrongdoing, those of you who are spiritual should set him right, but you must do it in a gentle way and keep an eye on yourselves so that you will not be tempted too. What would our churches be like if everybody was doing that? Do you think sins are mistakes? Oh, we're going to discuss that. I, I, that's may, you know, we can discuss it now if you want. Is there a difference between a mistake and a sin? Big difference. Big difference. What's the difference? A sin is an intentional or semi-intentional act. A mistake is, uh, I planted that tree in the wrong place. Mm -hmm. A sin is, I hurt that person. Mm -hmm. I hurt my wife. I hurt Jim. Yeah, I remember getting a paperback from, from math class. It had six sins on it. Mistakes. Mistakes. <laughs> I got I got four out of six. I see. <laughs> okay. Well, <clears throat> Paul goes on to say, look at the next couple of verses. Or, or actually, let's start with two. Help to carry one another's burdens, and in this way you will obey the law of Christ. If someone thinks he or she is somebody, when really they are nobody, they're only deceiving themselves. How's that for a warning? Uh, in the quarterly, they interpret the looking to yourselves uh, lest you be tempted in two different ways, and I tend to go with the second one. Um, I think if Paul was talking about trying to avoid uh, the sin that the person is in, he would have said, look unto Jesus, not look at yourself. Uh, so I think uh, it, to sort of expand on that, I would say uh, look at yourself, how weak and, and uh, prone to error you are, lest you be tempted to condemn this person when you mm -hmm. go to them. So that sort of puts you in a different position than somebody who just, you know, I, I, I know what's right and uh, mm -hmm. this person is obviously wrong and, and approaching them with a, an attitude of superiority. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's kind of like a, a little kid when you have a cake. You know, my little, my little boy wouldn't stick his finger in there and take a piece out, you know, if he eat it. But if he saw some other kid do it, well, mm -hmm. then he, um, the idea goes into his head, and then he's tempted yeah. to do it. So well, that happens a it's lot. It's interesting that the Greek word that's used to describe um, well, the, the talk in in, Rome, in Proverbs five twenty two, remember, is written in Hebrew, but it was translated into Greek, and the Septuagint suggests that sometimes sins can overtake us, almost as surprises us. Does that happen very often? Is it ever appropriate to lie? Well, we have okay, several, me, several stories in the Bible about people lying. Yeah, but l let's just let's not go back and look at those people. <laughs> you come to work some morning and you're really feeling lousy, and someone says, "How you doing? I'm fine." <laughs> well, you are. Is that a lie? Right. It, when they it's say a lie. I'm fantastic, that's when you're lying, right? <laughs> but if you're fine, that's, that's okay. No, if you're fine, that's a lie. <laughs> I'm fine, but I feel rotten. <laughs> I, see. <laughs> I see. Okay. But what if you really are sick? I mean, you know, maybe you're... Yeah. <laughs> well, I had that asked me today. Mm -hmm. I have a, a number of broken ribs right now. Okay. And they asked, well, how are you feeling? I said, well, I'm feeling fine. Okay. And I was feeling fine. Just don't you know, pat me on the back and push me to the side and I'll be okay. <laughs> but it's... Okay. <laughs> well, the Bible talks, some, there's some very interesting passages in Leviticus and Numbers about unintentional and intentional sins. 
There's a whole section. I'm not going to take time to read through the whole thing, but look at Numbers 15, 22 to 29. And um, I'll just read 29. The same regulation applies to all who unintentionally commit a sin. How do you unintentionally commit a sin? Whether they are native Israelites or resident foreigners. But then look at the next two verses. But any person who sins deliberately, whether he is a native or a foreigner, is guilty of treating the Lord with contempt and he shall be put to death because he has rejected what the Lord said and has deliberately broken one of, one of his commandments. He's responsible for his own death. I think, so we should, I think, mm -hmm. when a person sins and they say, it's okay, Jesus will forgive me. Mm -hmm. That's an intentional sin. Okay. So that's one of the questions that's raised in this lesson. If you sin, maybe sort of unintentionally, or, or, well, no, I mean, you do something you know is a sin at the time you're doing it. Then you ask for forgiveness. That, does that change it from intentional to unintentional? Yeah, ask for forgiveness. Change, how can you ta <laughs> change the intent yeah, after the fact? It may change the, the way you look at yourself mm -hmm. and that act. And if you really are repentant, like David mm -hmm. was in Psalms 51, then it's, then it's a I, different way of, you, you should be treated differently. I'm going to challenge you out there who listen to this lesson to, to think about David for a moment. Now, the, the sin that obviously jumps out at us in the story of David is sleeping with Bathsheba getting her pregnant, and arranging for her husband's death. Now, I want you to think about that for a moment. Not because of, not, I don't want you to think about David, I don't think, think, think about Bathsheba or Uriah. I want you to think about God. Bathsheba has been married to Uriah for some time. If she had gotten pregnant even once, she would have been home with her child, and David would never have been involved. Was God responsible for keeping Bathsheba from getting pregnant so that when she came to David, and she got pregnant, David would get caught. You mean did God stack the deck to make it happen? I'm, I'm just asking you. Or did the devil stack the deck and make Uriah infertile? Uh, there's some real questions we can, we can look at here. That <laughs> Why it's going to take an eternity. And yeah. when, do you think God was on David's mind when he was doing that kind of stuff? I, I don't think so. I think the he whole was, point is he wasn't. God mm -hmm. wasn't on his mind. And I think I think that's the unintentional sin there. Do you, what do you think about the idea that intentional sin should be punished with death? The intentional sin? That's what that's what we read there in the Bible. Well, we have no example of it in Scripture. Oh, it immediately follows. <laughs> okay, which one? Right after the, the passage I read to you. No. Numbers yeah, 15. No. But that was not a sin against people. So who should have thrown the first stone? Well, the, the, the question is, is, is that God told him to throw stones. Oh. I care about what it says about God. It, let, me just show, let me read to you. Well, it could be a sin against Once, people. while the Israelites were still in the wilderness, a man was found Wait, gathering firewood on the... Everyone. I'm reading uh, Numbers 15, 32. I just read 30 and 31. I'm 32. Once while the Israelites were still in the wilderness, a man was found gathering firewood on the Sabbath. He was taken to Moses, Aaron, and the whole community and was put under guard because it was not clear what should be done with him. Then the Lord said to Moses, the man must be put to death. The whole community is to stone him to death outside the camp. So the whole community took him outside the camp and stoned him to death as the Lord had commanded. So was that a mistake, or was he being rebellious? He was being rebellious. So he was he saying he was mad at something or mad at God. I'm going to pick up these sticks. This and not just a little bit rebellious. This was open, flagrant rebellion. Mm -hmm. To make a point. He was trying to make. He was a trying point. to make he, a point. He, he was. I, I think he was God. trying. To, he, I think he was trying to say, like some people in our day have said, I'm going to flagrantly deny that God exists. For example. God, if you exist, strike me dead. Okay, I'm still alive, so God doesn't exist. I mean, it was one of those kind of deals, I think. Okay, but in that, in that case, though, he had people there to make the lightning hit him. Yeah. Well, 
I'd yeah, I don't know about that. <laughs> well, what about habitual sins? Now, we, we, we say that Jesus um, was tempted in every way like as we are, but he never had a habitual sin. What do you mean by habitual? Come on, you know what habitual means. When well, you've already it. done. You've done a number of times. And you keep doing it like if I'm uh, are a those are the, addict. I, I, have, I have to deal every day with people who smoke. And they, they just, some of them just say, it is so difficult to stop smoking. Or swear. Right? Uh, or swearing. Or I, I try to help them. I try to help them. And believe it or not, I've actually helped hundreds of people stop smoking. And I think that's great. But it's not easy. Some, some of the experts have said stopping smoking, is, uh, nicotine is one of the most addicting substances there is. Worse than heroin, do you know? Sometimes. Yeah. In uh, Dare to Discipline, Dr. James Dobson talks about t disciplining two different situations. One mm -hmm. is childish irresponsibility and the mm -hmm. other one is willful defiance. So that's, that could put another nuance on, on the uh, situation. In, in, in the New Testament, uh, Paul talks about uh, sins which might be referred to as unintentional with the word katartizo. That word is used in the Old Testament Septuagint to talk about mending nets or even setting broken bones. Um, does that sound like something super serious? You have to mend the nets. Mend the nets. And let me read you Matthew 18. This is a passage we're all familiar with, and yet we, very few of us actually do it. Maybe we don't need to, I don't know. If your brother sins against you, go to him and show him his fault. But do it privately just between yourselves. If he listens to you, you have won your brother back. But if he will not listen to you, take one or two other persons with you so that every accusation may be upheld by the testimony of two or more witnesses, as the scripture says. And if he will not listen to them, then tell the whole church, the whole thing to the church. Finally, if he will not listen to the church, treat him as though he were a pagan or a tax collector. Well, after all that, is pointing, is the guy's pretty rebellious, wouldn't okay. you Okay. Well, I'm, I'm questioning, have you, have you seen that sequence being, ever being followed in your church? Anywhere where you've been? Not personally. <laughs> so no one's come to you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I straighten out the first time. <laughs> <laughs> Unless <Okay>. you're wrong. <laughs> well, what we tend to do is when something even fairly flagrant happens, we tend to talk about them behind their backs. Or we go to the professionals. Yeah, or we even you need to take care of this. Yeah, or we even despise them in our in our hearts. Well, we have the stories and you can decide what you want to do with this, because um, this is a big challenge. How did God deal with Nadab and Abihu? How did he do? And that was Leviticus ten, one to eleven. Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, number 16. Uzzah, 2 Samuel 6, 1 to 8. Ananias and, now some people say, well, that was the Old Testament. What about Ananias and Sapphira in Acts 5? What about Peterson, Mark 14, numerous verses? And then there's this quotation from Ellen White. So with the apostasy at Sinai, and that would be the time when uh, they were afraid that Moses had disappeared and was gone forever, and so they said, Make us a God that, like the one who as, is the God that they later claimed had led them out of Egypt. They made a golden, Aaron made this golden calf. So unless punishment had been speedily visited upon transgression, the same results would again have been seen. The earth would have become as corrupt as in the days of Noah. Had these transgressors been spared, evils would have followed greater than that than resulted from the sparing from sparing the life of Cain. It was the mercy of God that thousands should suffer to prevent the necessity of visiting judgments upon millions. All right, what do we imply from that? Does it sound like if God hadn't dealt with these about 3,000 who were killed that day, the, the, the evil would have spread to all the people of Israel? In order to save the many, he must punish the few. Furthermore, as the people had cast off their allegiance to God, they had for forfeited the divine protection. And deprived of their defense, the whole nation was exposed to the power of their enemies. Now, does that mean that if you sin, God can't, I mean, the devil claims you, so therefore God can't really help you anymore? What does that mean? 
Reading on, had not the evil been promptly put away, they would soon have fallen a prey to their numerous and powerful foes. Is God saying that if there's sin in the camp, he can't even help the entire nation of Israel? It was necessary for, and, and look at the story of Achan. And apparently there's a, there's a fulfillment of that. It was necessary for the good of Israel and also as a lesson to all succeeding generations that crime should be promptly punished. And it was no less a mercy to the sinners themselves that they should be cut short in their evil course. Had their life, uh, had their life been spared, the same spirit that led them to rebel against God would have been manifested in hatred and strife among themselves and they would eventually have destroyed one another. It was in love to the world and love to Israel and even to the transgressors that crime was punished with swift and terrible severity. Patriarchs and Prophets 325. Now, let me ask you something. If justice is swift, mm -hmm. right, as soon as you do something yeah. like that, would you, not, would you not do it because you were scared of the justice or would you do it because it's right? Okay, well, that's, that's a question that's all through the Old Testament. God scared them, and they would sort of straighten up for a little while and never last very long. They would say, oh, well, I guess God's not care about this so much, so we'll go back to our old ways. And finally, they get in a terrible mess, and finally God did something drastic. And so they, oh, oh, oh we straighten up again. And, I mean, that's all through the Old Testament. You know that you are assuming that the people back then were exactly like they are today. I'm just, I'm just assuming what I read in the Bible. I know, but um, if, you, if, if you carry that over to today, would that prescription work for the people today as opposed to back then where um, if I can get away with it, I'm going to do it, mm -hmm. you know, type of thing. I'm just saying that God doesn't change, but he kind of changes his way of dealing with people like, like Dennis said, you know, the, the two different crimes could be treated differently. I have another question. What happened to Aaron? To Aaron? Who built the golden calf. He ended up being buried on the top of Mount Hur. Was that an unintentional yeah. sin? No. What well, why David wasn't he Sheba? killed Nothing. with yeah. the three? He wasn't stoned. Yeah. No. <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah, and... and, and this is one of the challenges we'll have to deal with. Well, I mean, I think we'll be very, we'll learn a lot about it when we get to heaven. Well, because it, why God did this here, and he did apparently something almost opposite over there. Well, I think it's because the people are different. Okay. Well, I think God the two people are different, and Do we have, have to, to deal with them different. Wait till heaven to, to answer some of these questions, or can we? Well, no, we need to talk argument? about them now, because what it says about God is the most important thing of all. So we need to talk about them now, but we may not come to a final conclusion until we know more of the details. And that would be my. We talked earlier. There's God makes commands, or mm -hmm. we read, for example, in Numbers 13, God commanded that they send spies to spy out the land. Mm -hmm. But we know from Deuteronomy, I think it's chapter 1, that the people wanted to do the, doing the spying out. Mm -hmm. it's, and it's, Moses presented it to God, and God said, go ahead. Well, and the people wanted to go. They were, and it's like, God's going to say, okay, I can't prevent you from doing this. Go ahead and do it. Mm -hmm. It's not what I want. He didn't want them to spy out. There was no need for them to ever spy it out. The reason they went was because of unbelief. And that's why they wanted to spy and God said, go. Uh, yeah, it was, yeah, okay, it was unbelief. I think, I think probably they were all excited about the possibility they were looking forward to the land that they were going to inhabit, and yet they weren't quite sure that they would really be able to do it. So That's unbelief, yeah. because God said, I will give you this land. Yeah. Well, I mean, but look, then we that, read, though, the command, yeah. this is in, in Numbers 13, right before 15, when we talk about the stoning. The, um, it's as if God commanded them to do it. Mm -hmm. But they never needed to do that. Yeah. So the command is really God saying, you are going to be persistent in doing this. This is what you want to do. Then fine. Go and do it. He's not going to stop them. Mm -hmm. um, we see the, you, you brought up Ananias and Sapphira. You brought up uh, Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. But we have other verses that kind of help us deal with some of these things. 
Well, it's a little hard to explain anybody but God doing it when the earth opens up and people fall in and it closes over them. A few years ago, they had it, uh, earth open up in, uh, uh, at the Corvette Museum and a whole bunch of Corvettes fell into the thing. Yeah, but the that Corvettes was weren't having a meeting right then either. <laughs> now, <laughs> <we're going laughs> the earth does right open then. up. <laughs> the the we question isn't whether the earth opens up. The question is what, what, if, if it happens exactly when God says it's going to happen and exactly evolves just only the people that, in, that God said it was going to happen to and none of the millions of others standing around, well, you got a problem with that one. God's, oh, for, okay. God's foreknowledge and God's protection is, is still are, are in effect. So, so God heard them all over there. Have you to. stand here. No. You stand here because there's an earthquake coming. Just like the flood. <laughs> God knows when the flood's going to happen. God knows when the earthquake's going to happen, and and uh, the walls of Jericho fall down. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's other ways to explain this, unless we're uh, wedded to a to a particular position. Numbers 21. Mm -hmm. God sent fiery serpents to bite the children. Not if you read Daniel, uh, De Deuteronomy 8. They were there all the time. Yes. Could it be, when you look at the area where the children of Israel re were, were sojourning, mm -hmm. there's areas of these huge, uh, what they call the land, the, the structure there, karsts, mm -hmm. where they have huge cavities underneath. Some of these are so big you can put 747s in them. Mm -hmm. Could it be that God is protecting them all along here? Absolutely. I, I don't think and there's any problem with like, that. You know what? You were rejecting me? I'm not going to protect you anymore. And the whole thing falls in. Now the serpents, we know they were there all the time. Mm -hmm. And it says God sent the fiery serpents, but it, he didn't send them. And all White backs us up. It's he just can no longer protect them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean there are so many. Uh, and what are you going to do with the flood? But that, then that sounds like a, a naturalistic explanation. Yeah, for I, I have a real end, problem almost with. Almost like saying, well, they went across the Red Sea just because God happened to know when when the tidal wave wind. was coming or whatever it was, but he didn't really do that for them. Um, it, 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 it sounds like the same thing. I don't, I don't have any problem with that. The, the question is, you, you talk about your, word, your comment is going to be on the Egyptian being destroyed at the Red Sea. I, so I God caused it because that. he withdrew it, the, the support of the ocean. But Pharaoh and, and his army had seen ten plagues. They knew what was going on. Mm -hmm. And they, per, their presumption, they followed them into the sea. Yeah, they, prob they, sh they probably they should have known that they were yeah. going to be a disaster that, coming. That and, and as far as I'm concerned, I agree 100 percent with that point. Uh, that doesn't change the fact that God was the one who did it. It, it. Nobody. It wasn't the devil who separated the waters and let the Israelites go through and then closed the waters over the Egyptians. Uh, and and the, here's 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 a bigger problem. Those passages in the Old Testament were written to a very simple, concrete-thinking people. Uh, they weren't written primarily for us. Now, we have them in our day, and we need to interpret them. But anybody just superficially and even fairly deeply reading those passages in that context would have said, God did it. And that's, I don't think you can avoid that, yes. And we have to remember, who is the God of, at Sinai? It was Jesus. It was Jesus. Mm -hmm. There's another thing we should remember. Just because they died doesn't mean they lost. No, and Eternity. that's absolutely true. <laughs> and that, that's a very important point to remember. Every one of those people, whether they died in the flood, whether they were the firstborn in Egypt, whether they were Cordathan and Byram, every one of those people is going to stand up before the judgment of God during this time of pre-advent judgment that we're in right now and going to be ultimately judged as to whether or not it's safe to admit them to heaven. So, And they're, they're going to be treated at the end exactly the same as the rest of us. So there's no, no question about that as far as I'm concerned. So, but I'm happy to listen to other views. Uh, we've obviously expressed some here. That's Those good because I got all kinds of them. <laughs> well, <laughs> you, you, did, you did bring up uh, Patriarchs and Prophets. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I had mentioned that the, you know, the letter 14, 1883, it says that the, the, I was shown, and this is Ellen White speaking, that the judgments of God do not come directly out from the Lord, but rather in this way. They place themselves beyond His protection. He warns, corrects, reproves, and points out the only path to safety. Then, if those who have been the object of His special care will follow their own course of independent, independent of the Spirit of God, after repeated warnings, 
He then choose, they didn't choose their own way. He does not commission his angels to prevent Satan's decided attacks upon them. It is Satan's power that is in work on the sea, on the land, bringing calamity, distress, sweeping off multitudes to make sure, uh, make sure of his prey. The storm, the tempest, both by sea and land, will be for Satan, um, has come down with great wrath. He is at work. He knows his time is short. It's and his working. When God withdraws his protection, mm -hmm. and, and I, all I kinds of things happen. I don't have any, any problem, any question with that whatsoever. You could read her elsewhere where she says, if God were not protecting the word world right now because of the few followers he has here in this world, Satan would destroy everybody. That's right. Great controversy, page 35, uh, 36, 35, 36, and 37. Okay, so now let's, we can move on. I think you can bring your ideas in, but who is the worst sinner? It is, the one, is it the one who commits a, a so-called unintentional sin or the one who, filled with spiritual pride, condemns that person in his heart? Does this sound like the Pharisees in the New Testament? Now you've gone to meddling. <laughs> <laughs> Do we as church members uh, consistently practice the golden rule? Well, why is spiritual pride such a serious problem for Christians? We've been given lots of knowledge, and knowledge puffs up, mm -hmm. as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 8, 2, 1 and 2. There's a very interesting passage found in Luke chapter 8, the first three verses. Notice what this says about Jesus. And we usually don't, we, we somehow manage to look over this, or overlook it, as we read the story. Sometime later, Jesus travels through towns and villages preaching the good news about the kingdom of God. The twelve disciples went with him. We don't have any problem with this so far. And so did some women who had been healed of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, who was called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had been driven out. Joanne, whose husband Chusa was an officer in Herod's court. Susanna and many other women who used their own resources to help Jesus and his disciples. So Jesus and the twelve disciples are traveling around with a former prostitute and a society woman and a whole collection of other women. Rich women. Some of them very rich, many of them rich, apparently. Um, is that the way you pictured him as he was traveling around? Did he choose them or did they choose him? They choose him. Were they all saints? None of them were saints. They, all, they, were, they were all open to learning. And I think that's where we should all be. Paul calls the Corinthians saints, so well, that's the devil. <laughs> set apart. Those yeah, Corinthians. Set apart. They got to be set apart to go around with Jesus. So we, <laughs> one again, once again, we're going to look at the, these kind of commands. There's them in Romans and they're in Galatians. Look at Galatians 5:14. For the whole law is summed up in one commandment: love your neighbor as you love yourself. And Jesus Himself, of course, said it's not just loving your neighbor; it's loving God. Romans 13, 8, 10 says basically the same thing. So if that's true, and we have what it says back in Romans, I mean in Galatians 3, that in God's ideas there's no difference between free people and slave people, there's no difference between slaves and, uh, I'm sorry, between men and women. Jews and Gentiles. Th there's no difference between Jews and Gentiles. Does that completely eliminate any kind of racial, tribal, class distinctions? Gender distinctions? It, it does. It should. And that command comes all the way back from Leviticus. Mm -hmm. So they've had it since the beginning. Mm -hmm. Well, we do not know if Paul had a specific sin or incident in the church in Galatia in mind when he gave this instruction. We, w it would have been fantastic. I mean, how did Paul find out about whatever was going on in Galatia? And remember, Galatia is a fairly large area, so I'm sure there were multiple churches involved. Or at least there were, I mean, there, there are multiple churches that could have been involved. They may not have all been involved, but they could have been involved. So how about, Paul heard about them and how, whatever, we don't know. But um, however, if, it would have been really nice if we had gotten that side of the report as well. Well, you know what was really happening in Galatia was this and this and this and this. It would be easier to interpret what Paul says. We don't have that. Again, that's part of the instruction. Part of the story that we will get someday, presumably, when we get to heaven. Well, there are many people 
even among the heroes, the Bible heroes, who committed pretty serious sins. We think about David, we've already talked about him. Uh, Moses was a murderer before we already did anything else at all. Um, Peter swore that he would never leave Jesus. He would follow him even to death. And a few hours later he was swearing that he didn't even know him. Were those intentional sins or unintentional sins? Peter's standing by the fire near the back of the courtyard and someone says, you sound like a Galilean. You must have been with Jesus. And he said, I don't know him. Was that intentional? What he said was intentional. It was. Yeah. He said it out of fright and weakness. But Very still, much weakness. If, you're, if you're scared, I intentionally am going to say this to be safer. Yeah. We're all born with sinful natures in this world. We know that. It is so easy to be filled with spiritual pride and conceit when we think that others have fallen into sin and we're still standing. Oh, I'm so, so righteous here. So Paul warns us multiple times, and Jesus does too, it's now been almost 2,000 years since Christ came the first time. Why hasn't he come back? Well, Matthew 24, 14 might be one of the reasons that this gospel of the kingdom has not been preached to all the world for witness unto all nations. Are there other reasons? Do we have more evidence than any previous generation in our hands? We have the Bible. We have it translated in multiple Versions, if you don't like one, you can choose a different one. You can try cho choose any one of hundreds of languages if you prefer a different language. We have all the writings of Ellen White. Many of those have been translated into many languages. Um, Is that but, better than speaking directly with Jesus for two, three years, even though they didn't ask the right questions? Or is it better than uh, Adam and Eve talking directly to God and the angels in the garden? That's, that's the question. I mean, uh, it's, 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 it's what we have, and it's great to have the Bible, but I'm kind of jealous of those people. Well, and also, uh, Jesus entered the scene after 4,000 years of degeneration of the race, and now we've got another 2,000 years. So, mm -hmm. so we're, we have some degeneration well, accumulating in us, too. Well, you're right that we have a lot of data to look at, right? We mm -hmm. have the Bible, we have all these writings and whatever. But the question always comes back, do we need more? Well, okay, now let me ask a, the question from another side. One of the things we try to emphasize here, and I hope you've picked this up in your opportunities, you've had to listen to our class, what does it say about God? That's the most important part. Now, if God wants the gospel to be finished, why doesn't he just take a whole bunch of angels make them to appear like human beings and send them out to spread the gospel. They could do a perfect job. And it would take away the opportunity for us to love. Okay. And learn. Or at least in Is that, that way. the main problem? Um, well, why would we believe them? Well, because they would be speaking the truth. Did why? Jesus why how that? could we tell? I, how could we Jesus tell? Yeah. How can we tell if they're speaking the truth or not? I mean, how do what you are they going to do? How do you if tell when anyone's speaking the truth? Yeah, if we seek to do the will of the Father, we'll know whether they're speaking fr uh, from Him or of themselves. See, I, I think the question is poorly stated because it's, it's not that... It's intentionally... <laughs> okay. it's, yeah, it's not that we need more, it's that we need less. We have too much superstition. We have too much false teachings. We had need to remove all of that from the gospel to end up with the truth. Mm -hmm. I think uh, theologians have gonna, done a great job to confuse the issues. Yeah, we, we, have, we have talked many, a number of times, maybe not lots and lots of times, but many times in this class, about the fact that it's a lot harder to unlearn something that you really believed, realize, oh no, it's not true, than it is to learn something new. So we, if we have been led astray by those who, who are in authority, it's a challenge. To me, less is more, though. Yeah. 
<laughs> well, one of the reasons why God asks us to do it is because, and I'm the one who gets to practice this every week as, as leaning out in this class, if you want to try to prepare something and to teach it to other people, you better know it better than, I mean, you better have got it pretty clear in your own mind. So one of the reasons God asks us to spread the gospel is that we need to, we need to get it down ourselves so that we can go out and tell it to others. Unfortunately, too many of us are telling the wrong story. Yes. Many of the TV evangelists and many of the others. And Obviously, by, you know. by all the different denominations, all the different movements that are present. Yes. Well, actually, if a human being came and told the good news about humanity, it's saying more than any, any, any angel could say anyway. Mm -hmm. So... I think um, what, what, I think that's the reason right there because it just just that way of doing it is saying more than what an angel I mean, could say. God God could have the angels appear as angels, as bright shining beings that says, "You better believe this." Well, then you'd believe them because you were impressed, not because of the truth. Well, well, the devil could appear that same way. Exactly. Exactly. If, you, if we said, well, God, I'd like, I'd like you to spend an hour with me this week and tell me, get me all straightened out on all these things, and guess who would demand equal time? I think it's significant that degenerate humans are going to arrive at the co correct understanding at some point of the gospel. Apparently, we're still not in agreement, so we still don't have it. But this gospel will be taken to the whole world. That's a singular at some point, there will be a, not just a consensus, a full agreement mm -hmm. on what that message is. And I don't think it's going to happen until we get rid of the superstitions we still have in Christianity. And I don't want to go through them, but there are several. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we have false teachings that we haven't even recognized yet. So yes, knowledge shall increase, and that's a good thing, because that knowledge will help us to eliminate some of the falsehood. And probably at the same time, there will be persecution and other things like that that will cause a lot of people to say, well, I'm, I'm out of here. Well, <clears throat> um, look at Galatians verses 4 and 5. Galatians 6, we're in Galatians 6. Um, we already read verses 2 and 3, so 4. You should each judge your own conduct. If it is good, then you can be proud of what you yourselves have done without having to compare it with what someone else has done. Is that suggesting that God does or doesn't grade on, grade on the curve? We each have our own load to carry. What does that mean? Back in, remember, back in, back in Galatians 6, 2, just three verses up, it says, help, please bear one another's burdens. So our, our verse 2 and verse 5 in contradiction with, to each other. Well, there's certain no. things you can't carry for someone else. Well, it's interesting when it talks about bearing your own burden. One of the words in the Old Testament, in the, in the, in the uh, Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, one of the burdens that's carried using that word is pregnancy. A little hard to share that, right? Not, it's not easy for someone else to carry your pregnancy for you. Well, in the parable of the talents and the rulers of the cities, different ones had, had different amounts. Excuses, yeah. Well, no. Uh, oh, different. I see. Different, yeah. Uh, you know, ten talents, five yeah. talents. Well, it was five, two, and one, I think, or something yeah, like that. five, two, and, and one. And then they, they doubled. Uh, the first two doubled, and the other mm -hmm. one hit but his. So. Does, oh, go Yeah, ahead. so we're, we're each given uh, a measure of faith, and what we do with that is... Uh, is our responsibility. Mm -hmm. But you asked, does God grave on, grade on a curve? Mm -hmm. Is that a good concept or not? Or is well, that something we need to think about? <laughs> the problem I have with it is it sounds like in order to get to heaven, there are different, uh, you know, well, it's easier for some people than others. I, I, you know, and, and I, 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 th you I think salvation begins when we accept the Holy yeah. Spirit into our lives, when we are born again. So uh, in, if you well. put salvation off as something that's going to happen by and by, 
I think that muddies the, the water we get into. But, but it's true, and, and let's let's be honest with the with the evidence. There are the Moseses, there are the Jobs, there are the Enochs, and then there's the thief on the cross. Mm. So th all experiences are not equal. I mean, there's no way you can claim that all experiences are equal. Now, I, and you can all shoot me down here, but I have a personal opinion that there's going to be two very different classes, two classes, not more than that, two classes. Those who will actually be among what we call the 144,000, those who will be translated as opposed to actually tasting death, are going to have to stand through terrible times, they're going to have to be persecuted, some of them, their, their lives are going to be threatened, etc. They're going to be Job's, each individually, as I understand it. And those people will need to have a very high experience. The other class are people who are on the way Maybe if they were given more time, they would reach that level, but they're not there yet, and then their life is cut short for one reason or another, like the thief on the cross. And God says, I can look into their future. I can predict how they would have behaved. And, what. and really, the real question is, I can predict whether or not it's safe to admit them to heaven. And if it's safe to admit them to heaven, God will, God will save everyone that's safe to save. That's just, I think, goes without saying. But in verse 4 here, I think that mm -hmm. Paul is trying to say that we should check our own intentions. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And then um, we should keep within ourselves any reason to boast and not share those reasons with others. Mm -hmm. You see, uh, it's something we can recognize perhaps, oh, this is something I did quite well, but let's not sing it all over the place. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Well, our testimony of what God has done for us can be a form of boasting, if you want mm -hmm. to put it that way. I'm better off. You know, once I was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Uh, it's a testimony, and, and some might call that boasting if they didn't have that experience, but there was it's a, time. a godly experience. There was a time in the Adventist church when it was quite popular to say, I have a lot of money, I'm this and that, and I want to give a lot to the church, but it's like this because the Lord has blessed me. Mm -hmm. So it's all right if the Lord blesses you. I don't hear that quite so much anymore. I think that people are starting to recognize that sounds means, a little funny. It means the Lord didn't bless you. Yeah, exactly. Well, well maybe the Lord blessed well, like, me with something else. Mm -hmm. it, I mean, it could have been, but they, they just corrupted, them, uh, corrupted it. You know. But we're, 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 we're running down a little bit, so we need to move along here. Each of us has given our own, been given our own burdens. You know, one person, we've already mentioned this briefly, so you have a one kind of burden, I have a different kind of a burden. And, and, but we can help each other sometimes, but not, with, not in every case. Secondly, God does not intend for us to bear all our burdens alone. Remember Matthew 11. What does Jesus say in Matthew 11? Come to me, all you who are tired from carrying heavy loads, and isn't that a burden? I will give you rest. Take my yoke and put it on you and learn from me, because I am gentle and humble in spirit, and you will find rest. So who, who intends to bear burdens with us, no matter who we are? God himself. God himself will help us to bear our burdens. Well, have you ever been in difficulty or had a burden you were afraid you could not bear but were afraid to ask anyone to help? Why does that happen? Pride, shame, lack of trust, even a sense of self-sufficiency. Are those also sins that could bar us from the kingdom of heaven? Well, how should church discipline be handled? If you belong to a large church, how many people do you know who have been disfellowshipped recently? Maybe in some of the smaller churches where most everybody knows everybody else, something like that could happen. But in big churches, does that happen very often? Like the person said, it's easy to hide. Mm -hmm. I was in a in church. And noticed. Myra and I were in a church, at least, at least one church, where they wanted to take people off the rolls because it increased the ingathering goal imposed by the, by the conference. <laughs> For every member of the church, you had to raise so much money. And if you didn't have quite so many people on the roll, you didn't have to raise quite so much money. I once belonged to a 
a pretty good sized church in another part of the world. And um, it was a place where um, I was one of the few people from outside who had learned to speak the local language. And they said, they invited me. They asked me to come and join them and said, uh, you know, we, we think we need to look at our church books because there's quite a few people on our church books that probably shouldn't be there. So I said, okay, and I'm, 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 a, I'm a total outsider. I, I didn't know what to expect for sure. I went there, and there were something like 400 members in that church on the books. And we started down through the list. Well, I don't think he should be here anymore because he spends most of his time drinking. I don't think he should be on the church any, in the church membership anymore because he has three wives now. And I'm sort of, okay. <laughs> And we were down, I think by the time we got done, there were about 75 church members left. But, you know, it's, we don't like to do that kind of stuff. Um, who wants to be the one that has to say, oh no, this is not right? Well. Did you do that? Well, I was there. But I listened. You didn't go in and... and I, didn't, all straight, didn't, I didn't accuse anybody. I said, <laughs> I think you're doing the right thing. God bless you. <laughs> well, but you said this is the church is a hospital for sinners, not a museum for saints. But for those who long since left and they don't even come to church anymore and we know what their practices are, it's better that their name not be on the books, right? Better that they repent. Well, obviously, that would be perfect. And, and we, we actually sent out some people to go to these individuals say, you know, we, we, are, we would like to have you on our record still. Please come back. You know, we know what you're doing. Uh, but you really belong in the Adventist church. You were an Adventist once. And uh, I think some actually did come back, but not too many. Well, and White says to press together, mm -hmm. press together. Mm -hmm. And I think if we were closer to one another, some of these things would be handled. You know, when you're dealing with strangers yeah. that you've never met, yeah. never had any, you know, it's, it, yeah. it, it's not impossible, but it, it's different than if you have this organic group of people who are fellowshipping and somebody yeah. starts slipping away, the group can seek to bring them back in. In this, in this chapter, Galatians 6, we're dealing with the first part of that chapter. Uh, we'll be, next week we'll be dealing with the last part. There are several, past, several things, either expressions or, or individual words, that are unique. They're not found anywhere else in the New Testament. One of those expressions is the law of Christ. What does the law of Christ mean? Now, I can tell you how our, our dispensational friends would interpret this. They would say, well, in the Old Testament, there was the law of Moses. And now we have the law of Christ. And so clearly... Are those different? What? And how are those different? Well, they think it's very different, especially because in the law of Christ, you don't have to keep the seven-day Sabbath. So is that the only difference? Well, that would be the Pretty main. Much, yeah. yeah. I mean, that would be the one that sticks out. So, well, is it a general principle to describe the way in which Christians are to help each other bear their burdens in this context? Was that the law of Christ? Well, how do we explain the apparent contradiction between Galatians 6, 2 and 6, 5? We've already mentioned that a little bit about some burdens you have to carry yourself, some, other, some burdens you can help others carry. In light of how Jesus dealt with sinners, what approach should the church take? If we follow the example of Christ, would we ever go wrong? How many, how many flagrant sinners do we encourage to join the church? Would we have accepted the woman taken in adultery into our church? The woman at the well. The woman at the well. Well, wouldn't or they? Or Zacchaeus. Or Zacchaeus. Oh, boy. The tax cheat. Don't they show some inclination that they want to come into the church? Well, I, mean, I mean, if they're just the sinners, yeah. mm -hmm. if, if they're sinners, well, and you can't just grab them, pull yeah. them in the church yeah. and fix them. Ellen White says that the woman taken in adultery became one of Jesus Christ's most devoted followers. Mm -hmm. So there was some indication somewhere. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think we should accept everyone in the church. 
that doesn't mean we should accept everyone in the roster of the yeah. church. There can <laughs> be a difference yeah. there between yeah. those two. Well, there's a word in Galatians 6, verse 7. Let's look at that for a moment. Galatians 6, verse 7. Do not deceive yourselves. No one makes a fool of God. People will, re will reap exactly what they sow. And um, the word mocked, God is not mocked. Uh, my version says, uh, what does it say? I'm sorry. What I have here is uh, make a fool of God. The, the original word means you turn up your nose at somebody. That's mocked. Yes, that's an interesting expression. It's used sometimes in the Old Testament uh, for dis discussing how the Israelites dealt with the prophets who came to speak God's word to them. Well, in the Christian life, what does it mean to reap what you sow? Well, you grow a garden, you plant seeds, and you mm -hmm. grow whatever the seeds are made out of. Why is it that we so often want to plant one kind of seed, and, we want, and then we want to change the consequences? I want to plant pumpkins, but I want, it, I, want, I want to reap corn. It might be fun to reap pumpkins, but then <laughs> the pumpkins come out, and I hate pumpkin. Okay. Well... <laughs> What do we do with the Galatians 6, verse 10? So then, as often as we have the chance, we should do good to everyone, and especially to those who belong to our family in the faith. Is that discrimination? Hmm? Well, are you using discrimination as a bad word, or are you just, I mean, because... You know, you, I discriminate between this shirt and that shirt and that yeah, tie. And then, you know, I make choices. Uh, it's, it's separating. It's kind of like judging. Well, how do we reach out, and we're running out of time, how do we reach out to business associates and neighbors and even strangers? Are we doing the best we can to reach to all those people? Are we, do they see something in us that, that makes, that's attractive? We have this quotation, the Spirit of God keeps evil under the control of conscience when man exalts itself above the influence of the spirit, he reaps a harvest of iniquity. Over such a man, the spirit has less and less influence to restrain him from sowing seeds of disobedience. And she goes on to say, I don't have time to read the rest of it, but as you commit more and more sins, then it becomes easier to do that. If you follow Christ closer and closer, it becomes easier to do that. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you for the privilege we have of meeting like this and to discuss your word. We thank you for these messages of challenge and message, challenge, th challenges to our thinking we find here in the book of Galatians. May they continue to cause us to scratch our heads, but to learn more about you as we do is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.